It's a bit of a transition to the Middle Ages, but <laughs> why not? <laughs> Halfway through the journey we are living, I found myself deep in a darkened forest where I had lost all trace of the straight path. Ah, how hard it is to tell what it was like, how wild the forest was, how dense and rugged. To think of it still fills my mind with panic. So bitter it is that death is hardly worse. But to describe the good discovered there, I here will tell the other things I saw. I cannot say clearly how I entered there. So drowsy with sleep had I grown at that hour when first I wandered off from the true way. But when I had reached the base of a hill there at the border where the valley ended that had cut my heart to the quick with panic, I looked up at the hill and saw its shoulder mantled already with that planet's light that leads all people straight by every road. With that, my panic quieted a little after lingering on in the lake of my heart through the night that I had so grievously passed. And like a person who with panting breath struggles the shore out of the wide ocean only to glance back at the treacherous surf, just so my mind, racing on ahead, turned back to marvel at the pass no one ever before had issued from alive. The journey Dante offers us in his Divine Comedy stretches before us from the dark wood of its beginning, down through the chasm of hell, up the terraces of purgatory, and into the spheres of heaven, as a record of a living experience, opening in bitterness, mounting through hope, and ending in vision. The poet insists that the person he is now, fashioning the poem, is the person who then walked into and out of that other world. His work is more than fiction. The poet insists on this acceptance. It is a real recapitulation of what happened to him. What happened in him, to him, in turn, is meant to happen to the reader. Otherwise, why write the poem? The 14,233 lines are the poet's free gift to the reader. What Dante has already experienced awaits each one who sits down with this journey in words before him or her. He challenges each one to be the wayfarer here and now that he was then and there. First, he had to meet the challenge himself, of course, by going back to the experience and putting it all into a poem. For Dante, there are no apathetic wayfarers. They lie outside hell, purgatory, and heaven. They travel no farther than the third canto. The reader who circles into the inner unknown world of this poet's making finds that one is never alone, however, for Dante speaks time and again to directly to his reader. May God so grant you, reader, to find fruit in your reading. Now ponder for yourself how I could keep the eyes in my head dry. Inferno 20. The invitation to do more than read, to live the journey, motivates every line of the comedy. On Good Friday of 1300, Dante began a week of religious experiences that transformed his whole life. From near despair at his own sinfulness, especially his own pride and apathy, he found a hope for change of heart and mind. More than he expected awaited him, for more than reform occurred. He was swept up in vision so that his entire being, before and after, came into focus and he truly converted, turned around, and became another man. St. Paul, he recalled, had spoken of something similar happening to him. Quote, 
I knew a man in Christ more than 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knows. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. That's Second Corinthians. Later, St. Ignatius of Loyola would cast this opportunity for conversion and contemplation in the form of a spiritual retreat. The world had been created in the same span of time, and with it, man and woman. The creation of the new man and woman should take no longer than that. Where did this conversion take place? As specific as he is about the time, Dante remains deliberately vague about the location. In his native Florence, in Rome, where Pope Boniface VIII had declared 1300 to be a jubilee year of special grace, or in some rural and remote area of Italy that the poet describes so vividly at moments in his journey. The place does matter because for the poet it is a real spot, a crossroad of crisis and decision. But he has sublimated it into anywhere for the reader's sake, since the experience of the journey was and is inward, downward, upward, and beyond, to a center that is everywhere and a circumference nowhere, as in St. Bonaventure's definition of God. Dante's holy and Easter week vision changed his view of the world, which up to this time he had worked to reform as a citizen, a soldier, a politician, and a poet. Its failure to live up to Christ's call for love of God and neighbor shocked him especially in the practices of an official religion that had fallen politically, militarily, and financially into the same bad ways of the people whom Christ had sent it to redeem. For Dante, there could be no middle ground, no halfway measures between commitment and compromise. The worst sins loomed as the systematic evils of everyday life, the taking of bribes, selling of church goods and offices, the deceit, scandal, and treachery on which the century thrived. Italy lay in a shambles because of the crass pettiness of important leaders in church and state. Total honesty, candor, openness. These virtues Dante now saw to be the fruits of the searing and uplifting call that he had heard and heeded. Ironically, he was soon to become the victim of all the vices opposed to these virtues. He would be exiled from his beloved Florence, sentenced to death in his absence, allowed only later to return if he would confess to a list of the offenses he lived to despise. He refused. How could he lie about his own person? Like Thomas More, he knew that his own conscience would act as his final judge. That conscience few men have honed to such a sharp edge of sureness, steadiness, and pointed truth. Such is the confidence of saints and seers. Dante's vision in that way was like Paul's, although in Canto II he demands that we not compare him to the chosen vessel, since the event left him another man, a self within his still weak and fallible ego. Having known profoundly the purifying of consciousness beyond all thought and emotion, the flight of the mystics, Dante, right, for the next dozen years, lived with the memory of emptiness, searching, and filling with light. Perhaps other glimpses and moments came back to him. Still, that week remained as the turning point in his life when at 35, halfway through the traditional Lifetime of 70 years, he woke to find himself deep in a darkened forest and ended moving with the sun and the other stars in utter harmony with love. But to describe the good discovered there, I here will tell the other things I saw. Dante did not rush to begin writing down what he had seen. The experience, he reminds us, was beyond his own or anyone's expression. How could words describe or picture what it had been like for the self to harrow the depths of human existence, to rid itself of egotism, and to be filled with joy 
in the presence of the unseen trinity of love, loving, and loved. No one before had dreamed of putting his own inner autobiography in prose or poetry. Augustine had offered his account in a chronology of outward events leading to an interior ascent to God, and he has dressed his book to his maker. But Dante's experience was entirely different. He was a man of another age, temperament, and vision. In Canto II of the Inferno, Dante reveals the eternal origin of his historic journey. He has his guide Virgil say that Beatrice, the poet's love of his younger and idealistic years, came to him on the poet's behalf at the request of Saint Lucia, Lucia, sorry, patron saint of light and seeing, who in turn was responding to a plea from the Virgin Mary. Dante quotes Virgil, who quotes Beatrice, who quotes Mary, and Lucia, a quotation within a quotation within a quotation, as circles inside circles take us to the heart of the poem. At the beginning, we touch the end. In an instant, there becomes here. The inspiration of the moment is already complete before it comes to the poet's listening. He has been called before he answers. Notice that the links are all conversations. For the poem itself progresses in a series of interviews, face to face, until the finer, final encounter with God in the human person of his son. Notice, too, that this trinity of feminine requests begins and ends after the poem itself has opened. When panic has already driven the pilgrim back from the barren slope, thwarted by the three beasts that blocked his way, the leopard of greed, the lion of violence, and the she-wolf of intemperance. But heaven acts quickly to save the pilgrim. What starts at the celestial heights spirals down to hell with the speed of light to bring Virgil immediately to Dante's side while he is still breathless and baffled on the hillside. By now, we should perceive that not only does Dante's poem have a circular structure down to the hollow cone of hell up along the winding terraces of purgatory and straight up into the whirling spheres of heaven. But that reading the poem must be a circular experience. Since Dante the poet only started to write after Dante the man had looked into the circle and center of God, so the reader has no linear work to read in order to get through and finish the poem. The comedy intends us to find our way through its labyrinth in as many ways as there are readers. By returning to the beginning at the end, by studying one sin or one virtue or one saintly example intently, by comparing one canto with its parable, parallel in another canticle, by turning back as well as forward, by moving around within the poem until we know every stone and leaf of the landscape and every intonation of the human voices that call out to speak to us. Such is the ideal reader that Dante has in mind. In a sense, James Joyce in our century expected the same dedication and response. Amazingly, both authors have received such readership. But Dante does not have the specialist or scholar in mind as perhaps Joyce must, given the nature of his temperament and times. No, Dante wanted the Tuscans of his day to see as he had seen the distortions sin causes in our makeup as human beings, the beauty that the practice of virtue fashions in the human spirit, and the joy that peering beyond our small world into the vast rows of the universe that brings to the beholder. And if the Tuscans of his day refused to follow him seriously, then the poet hoped that generations ahead would see his vision of Beatrice, the possibility of rising in this life above petty self-indulgence, indulge, violence, and greed. This way to vision is a negative way, as the mystics, mystics have shown us, a journey into not knowing, isolation, error and trial. No one wrote the poem for Dante and no one will read it in your place. 
The other side of insight, guidance, and assurance is the absence of all these as we go. Silent, solitary, without escort, we walked along, one behind the other, like minor friars traveling the road. The same sense of traveling the road alone opens the journey into the underworld as the wayfarer sets out in Canto II, the beginning of the inferno after the prologue to the comedy itself. As evening falls, the pilgrim readies himself for what lies before him, confident of what he knows in his own mind and feels in his heart. Day was now fading, and the dusky air released the creatures dwelling here on earth from tiring tasks. And while I, the only one, readied myself to endure the battle both of the journey and the pathos, which flawless memory shall here record. This sense of solitude in life is the hidden secret of the poem. For what immediately awaits the reader is utterly devoid of solitude. The descent first confronts us not with sights, but wailing and screaming, swirling up out of the pit. In the crowded cramping of hell, no privacy exists. Even the most isolated there, Judas, Cassius, and Brutus, each being chewed in the jaws of Lucifer, have one another and the eternal claustrophobia of hellmouth. They are inside Satan himself, the most intimate and terrible of punishments. Above them, souls are harried, whipped, whirled in the wind, boiled in blood, muck and excrement, beaten, torn, stuffed, turned into serpents or trees, pronged, peeled, burned, and caked in ice. The drama of these torches should not distract us from the inner drama of his wayfaring soul. At the bottom of the universe in Antonora, among those who have been treacherous to their homeland, Dante tells us of people locked in ice. After that, I saw a thousand faces so purpled with cold that a shivering still grips me, as it always will, at frozen ponds. Dante reminds us that it is the world of our own seasons and living that concerns him, and that the memory he has of these events is now to be ours. Out of his own solitude, he speaks to ours, reminding us that the only difference between the people here and there is death. The damned are never alone, and they have been denied the greatest privacy of all, that of their own death. Quote, these people have no hope of again dying. Dante's poem, then, is the mystic's experience beyond death, the glory of vision and the agony of not being partaker completely in that beatitude. It is the most Christian of poems because it is grounded in the resurrection and not simply as life after death, but in the presence of the risen life already in lives transformed by grace. There has become here, then is now. Halfway in the journey we are living, each reader sees, sets out on the same road. Dante begins his poem not with I, but we. The darkness and light take shape within each self. The voices reach only th these ears, and the images form only to these eyes. After writing the comedy, the poet himself became another reader, like the rest of us. We join him in meeting that world he left behind him. And who would not be glad, even in hell, to encounter Farinata, Brunetto Latini, Ulysses, or Count Ugolino? And what a good guide Dante is, urging the reader onward with Virgil by his side, the author and sustainer of the journey. We are the company we keep in our reading. Thanks to Dante, each of us is welcomed to that company as he pictures his own reception among the poets he has read and loved, Homer, Horace, Ovid, Lucan, and of course, Virgil himself. Each reader can say of that time and moment, this way we walk together toward the light, speaking of things as well unmentioned here as there it was as well to speak of them. Dante creates a new conversation with each reader he meets, speaking of things unmentioned in his lines. But part of what reading does is to impact such secrets to each person setting out in solitude 
along the winding path. And now I'd like to read just a few uh, poems or, and the introduction uh, to uh, my book, All right, A New Life, Learning the Way of Omega. In his La Vida Nuova, The New Life, Dante writes a prose commentary on his poetry to tell the story of his love for Beatrice from the time he first sees her at the age of nine in the streets of Florence until 18 years later when he has a vision of her in heaven. The book I have written here has no such sublime purpose, but it is intended to combine poetry and prose in a reflection of how we learn from reading to see the world around us with clearer vision, to enjoy the sounds of music and nature more clearly, to read with greater attention and use of our senses and imagination, to love family, friends, and God with a more open mind and heart, and to be ourselves with deeper sensitivity and awareness. And I'd like to read a poem, a sonnet that I wrote, okay, after visiting China. Xing Ping. Nothing I've seen resembles these mountains, unless it's the painted scrolls I've always imagined to be imaginary. Fountains of rock rising straight up in a cloud squirreled maze. Pine capped stone columns suspended in space. As we cruise the River Lee, they loom like ghosts of a terracotta army or a lost race of giants banished by the Lord of Hosts. Two cormorants perch on a fisherman's boat at reflection of yellow beach. Then with a swish of black wings mounting to cliff height, they float in the air, then dive for their catch of fish. Women with baskets trot down the slope flanks of Snail Hill. Children with poles wave from the banks. I spent a year in Algeria, okay, teaching on a Fulbright, and one uh, afternoon I sat at the edge of a farmland field uh, that uh, reminded me uh, of a Van Gogh-like right, scene unfolding itself. Fields ascending. The wheat bends with the wind, bobbing in different directions. The afternoon light slants in behind the stalks, leaving the sky immense and blue. Poppies and daisies spangle the bank where I sit. Butterflies dart and dip. The wheat rustles as it blows back and forth, yellow and brown. Twelve crows circle above me, black wings flashing gold. I watch a palm tree, fountain green fireworks overhead, white cloud puffs smoke in the sky. The sun explodes into red. Although I spent a year in North Africa visiting many right, old cities and ruins, I remember best that afternoon near our apartment with its sunlight, wind, and colors. The outer light creates its own moments of illumination that continue long after to glow in the imagination. This is a series of sonnets titled, Give Us This Day. It was inspired by my cousin, uh, Virginia Brennan, who was a collagist. She took stamps, she took any number of images and put them together. One, last night my mother appeared beside my bed, unsmiling, dressed in Sunday best, her face pink, still in her 90s, without a trace of care or wrinkles, and she five years dead. At first I did not recognize her. Instead, I thought I had awakened to black space lit by a portrait. Then her gaze and grace etched in her clear features. Mother, I said, why are you here? She quickly disappeared, 
without a word or change of her expression. My sister Mary telephoned today. Virginia's cancer, it's worse than we feared. I felt the first heart murmurs of depression. Mother, I pray, be with us on the way. Two, I never thought that we would see this day. Skyscrapers in flames, collapsing like snow avalanches, climbers caught in the ice flow of falling blocks, glass, steel, and leaded gray masonry melting in smoking disarray down to the ground, blizzards of white dust blowing clouds of concrete to the crushed streets below. Crowds standing in awe spin round and run away. The World Trade Center towers have been smashed to stone rubble by a skyjacker's attack. We witnesses are numb, struck dumb, hopes dashed by horror and dread. How dare we go back? How can we love and trust in one another when brother storms and strikes down his own brother? Three, Virginia, your collages of quilt cut clips from high gloss calendars, art magazines, museum catalogs, books, and postcard scenes are all laid out in streamed mosaic strips of color scraps. The shattered icon grips us so that what the kaleidoscope means falls into place, reds, yellows, blues, and greens of limbs torn and transformed, hands, faces, lips. September 11th, picture the pain, dying yourself, you glimpse the grid of death, watching the towers cascade like sheets of rain and heard a voice call out with her last breath, from thy table, Lord, of living and dead, let fall a morsel, morsel of our daily bread. And I'll end with a poem, Being and Time, which owes a lot to Heidegger. One, we walk into our lives. We saw with our own eyes on the wide landscape of being light for all afternoon, that day in April, we trekked the Shongunk Stone Ridge on Gertrude's nose and Millbrook above the Hudson Valley and the river curled gleaming in the distance. From Storm King to the Catskills, soaring range on range before us while we strode onward, true north, all that long April afternoon when light streamed like rain from clouds crossing our trail in the blue-white sky overhead, spreading and sifting the sun around, over, and under us in the broad landscape of being as we glimpsed through our own eyes how we walk into our lives. Two, we walk out of our lives. We felt in our own hearts on the gray cliff of time, snow falling on all morning that day in December, we hiked the Litchfield Glacier Ledge by Rainbow Falls to Castle Rock above the Minnewaska Gorge, spiked with cedar and fir from Tilson to Haseko Lake, glittering like a star beyond us while we tramped onward due south all that brisk December day when snow fell like sunlight, shattered to crystals, blown in our faces, brushed by feet, swirling and drifting dust around, over, and under us on the white ridge of time as we knew in our own hearts how we walk out of our lives. Thank you.